Hello, everyone. My name is Abram Bixler, and I'm an agricultural officer at FAO, and I'm very pleased to be here with you today. I'm sad that I couldn't be there in person. I know that's one of the things that we're missing from the COVID-19 pandemic is the ability to share and network and learn together in person. But I'm happy to be here uh, virtually with you and um, coming to you from Rome, where I work in agroecology and ecosystem services, and that includes pollinators. So I'm very happy with your work and with this conference, and I just encourage you to keep up the good work there. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the intersection of sustainable food systems and pollinator health. And this is uh, really exciting because this, these are, these are the, the issues that I work in. And I'm a very pragmatic person, so I also wanna make sure that we just don't talk about the intersection, but I also wanna share some tools with you that we at FAO have developed, not only for pollinators, but also for, for measuring a, the, and the evidence of sustainable food system and the impact that they have on pollinators. So that's exciting. Um, and that's, uh, this is probably the first time that I've shared some of this data. So it's, it's brand new and fresh and I'm excited about that. So I just wanna start off with just a brief overview of pollination's contribution to food security and livelihoods. And many of you are probably well aware of this, you work in it, uh, but it's, I think important to know that we at FAO work on pollinators. And the reason why we work on pollinators is because pollinators play an important role to ensure food production and by consequence, food security and, and better nutrition. And if you don't know FAO, we are the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. We, we really are, our main constituents are the member countries that make up our governing bodies. So currently we have 192 member countries. Um, many of these are part of the broader United Nations. Uh, the majority are, are actually, but we are a UN specialized agency and our specialization is in food and agriculture. And so we serve as a, a neutral knowledge exchange. We serve in a normative role where we can help advise on policies, can help on advise on norms, and norm setting and standards, as well as on technical issues. And we also have an operational side in which we actually implement projects. We work with countries to implement projects. We work with civil society, uh, such as NAPSI. We work with um, academia and researchers as well. So, and we work with farmers and farmers organizations. And that's really, that part's what got me into the organization and my interest there is, is to connect especially those on the ground with consumers in an effort to help countries um, implement and attain the sustainable development goals. So that's kind of our broad overarching framework and the SDGs really guide us in our work because the, the countries of the United Nations have signed on to the SDGs and we want to help them attain the SDGs um, for the sake of, sake of the world. Our, uh, the pollinators agenda is closely related to our strategic framework. Our strategic framework at FAO was, was endorsed by our conference, which is one of our governing bodies in June of this year. And we have four betters that form the broad umbrella of the framework. We have better life, better production, better nutrition, and better environment. And almost all of these have a pollinators potential have entry points for pollinators to be mainstreamed into them, better production, of course, and better nutrition, but also better life. When we talk about um, managed bees and beekeeping and livelihoods and better environment because the important role that pollinators play in pollinating the angiosperm flowering plants of the world that, that we rely on for all of the ecosystem services, including agriculture. And pollinators form many entry points for the SDGs. One of the organizations we work with is Apomondia, and um, Apomondia released earlier this year a, uh, an excellent report on how beekeeping, and we enlarged it to pollinators, can help attain the SDGs, and, and every SDG was in there with, with natural entry points for pollinators. Why do we work and, and how do we work on pollinators? Not only is pollinators uh, an entry point, for our strategic framework, but we have a mandate from the Convention on Biological Diversity to develop and implement the International Pollinator Initiative 1 and 2. So the IPI 1 was, um, was started and finished up in 2017. 
And in 2009 to 2015, we implemented that through a GEF project, a global environment facilities project called Conservation and Management of Pollinators for Sustainable Ag through an ecosystem approach. And um, really that GEF, that global GEF project allowed FAO to mainstream the pollinators agenda inside the organization. And we developed different tools to raise awareness on pollinators. And we, we used the that grant to, to also help the countries that were part of it advance their pollinator conservation, their pollinator understanding, their pollinator data collection, and also another component of that was field level implementation. In 2018, we received the mandate to facilitate the second, the follow-up to the IPI-1, which was IPI-2.0. Unfortunately, that mandate doesn't come with funding, so we're still looking for funding. Um, however, pollinators continues to be mainstreamed, and you'll get a glimpse of that in, in this talk as I share some of the tools we've developed specifically in agroecology that include a very strong pollinators component as we look for relationships between sustainable agriculture and pollinators, because sustainable agriculture is key to help to attaining many of the, the SDGs. Um, why are pollinators important? You've all probably seen this, this graph, but um, you, pollinators, when you look at their global importance for crops, for food crops, what we know is that pollinators affect 35% of global agricultural land and support the production of 87 of our leading 115 food crops worldwide. Um, and this, this was released a while ago and needs to be updated. And you often hear it quoted in various um, ways. You might hear 70% of our food crops depend on pollination. Well, there's more nuance to it. But what we do know is that pollinators support the production of 87% of the leading 115 food crops worldwide that that study looked at. So they're important. Animal pollination is important. And um, we're, we're not talking just about bees. As you know, there's a big focus on bees and beekeeping, and they're great. They're very important for many high value crops. They're important for pollination globally. Um, they're important for livelihoods. But we're talking about all types of animal pollinators, so bats, uh, invertebrates, the different insects, the 20,000 or so other bees <laughs> that, that are out there. So that's what we're looking at when we talk about pollinators. We're talking about the broad sense. We also know that the economic value of pollination services is massive. Estimates range from about $200 billion annually up to $500 billion annually. Again, there's nuance to it, but we know that pollination services are absolutely um, an important role in, in economics. And the USDA has their own studies on this as well. Um, this is globally uh, what we know. And, um, you know, these, the, the data, as scientists, we're, we're always trying to, to better hone our understanding. And so one thing is that we need to continue to update and um, look at, at the data, see what it tells us. But that's the most recent um, understanding of that globally. We also know that good pollination results in improvement to quality as well as yields. And this is especially important with high value horticultural crops. So that's the reason why FAO works with pollinators and how pollination is connected to food, to food security. Um, and so this is a, an example of a strawberry that, and other strawberries that have not been fully pollinated. So quality and yields are improved with good pollination. Another reason why pollination's importantness is because horticultural crops, many of which are pollinator dependent, are essential for fighting hunger and malnutrition and also because of their livelihood aspects. And FAO is hosting the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables, so this is especially important. And we're mainstreaming the importance of pollinators into this year because we know it's, it's so important. So if you try to distill it down, I think we can say very strongly that sustainable food systems need pollinators, but also pollinators need sustainable food systems. What I mean by that, what I've shown you is that 
for our food systems to produce healthy, nutritious um, food in the quantities and the yields that we need. We need pollinators for that, but also pollinators need sustainable food systems. Many of the threats to pollinators are driven by human activity and much of that activity is related to industrialized input intensive agriculture. So um, they both need each other. We, oops, sorry, pollination services also contribute to safeguard agriculture and the broader environment. So getting into the ecosystem services component, um, we know the pollinators are absolutely essential to ecosystem functioning. About 90% of all angio, uh, of all plants on the planet, the angiosperms, the flowering plants, 90% um, need pollinators for seed dispersal. And so healthy ecosystems rely upon pollination. Agriculture relies upon healthy ecosystems to support, to provide the ecosystem services for agriculture. Many of the regulating services um, that agriculture depends upon, water, pollination, are, are, are provided by healthy ecosystems. Healthy ecosystems need pollinators. We also find that there's a higher dependence on animal pollination in the tropics, in mountains, and arid ecosystems. And these are the places where many of the vulnerable people in the world, many of the malnourished, many of the people that we are helping at, as FAO through better agriculture also live. So not only is there a need for sustainable agriculture in these places, but we also know that in those ecosystems, there's a higher dependence on animal pollination. So again, pollinators need healthy, eco need healthy agricultural systems and um, sustainable agricultural systems need pollinators in order to keep functioning. And we just, we know also of the massive diversity of pollinators. Uh, unfortunately, most of our pollinator data comes from the global north. And so one part of IPI2 is to continue to collect data on pollinator diversity. It, the IPBES report on pollination points this out very strongly that there is still much more data needed on pollinators, on their diversity, on their functioning, on, on their threats in the developing world, which is also where FAO does most of its work in terms of agriculture development. So I wanna give you some examples of data from the field that connects pollinators and sustainable agriculture. And so this is the first time I've ever presented this. This data is hot off the, not off the press, but hot off the Kobo toolbox that we're using to collect it. Um, but we developed in order to create evidence on the performance of agroecology. And that's a whole nother webinar on what is agroecology. But agroecology, according to FAO, we've defined it through our 10 elements of agroecology. It was done over a very consultative process lasting four years merging the science and the experience from the field with farmers and the NGOs and governments and civil society. So the 10 elements frame our thinking of agroecology. In a nutshell, agroecology is the application of concepts, of ecological concepts and principles to the design and management of sustainable food systems. And I work in agroecology and pollinators are a very important part of that. So we've developed tape in order to collect evidence on agroecology's performance across the dimensions of sustainability. Um, very quickly, the way that tape works is that we have both a high level territorial inference space. And so a territory is, can be defined as a food shed, as community, it can be defined as um, the relationships between different actors, the territory gets to the understanding of, of a broader food system. Um, the starting point in most cases is the farm and the household level, but we also have an inference place of territory. And that's what step zero is for. Step zero provides a description of the systems and the context at that territorial level. Um, this is basically a characterization. What are the production systems? What are the demographics? And importantly, what are the existing policies or enabling frameworks at that territory level, that helps promote agroecology and sustainable agriculture and food systems or disable those food systems. So it's a stock taking. Step one and step two actually collects data at the farm and the household level. And so that's our experimental unit, the farm and the household level. So once you've defined and mapped your territory, 
you create a sampling strategy of X number of farms and households. You can do different typologies of farms to compare, to, to just find what the current status is. Um, but step one and step two collects data at the farm and the household level with two steps. The first is a characterization of agroecological transition. What we're trying to measure is multidimensionally how sustainable is a particular farm or household. We use the 10 elements with the Likert type index to create that. The next step, step two, actually measures the performance of that farm or household on five core criteria of sustainability. So there's a linkage because you're measuring how the farm performs overall, or sorry, is characterized on the using the, the lens of agroecology. And then you actually have quantifiable data on its performance. So you can look for relationship as farms become more uh, agroecological, are there relationships to X, Y, and Z? Step three brings that information back to the broader territorial level. And it's a chance with, for participatory analysis and interpretation to talk about the next steps, to talk about what hinders or what has enabled sustainable agriculture there. What I wanna show you is that um, here are 10 elements of agroecology. They cut across the dimensions of sustainability. They can be used in any context. They can be used on any size farm because they offer entry points for thinking about the complexity of food systems. And tape is built on the 10 elements. And what I wanna show you is, is actual pollinator data that we're collecting using tape. Here's an example. Um, the, the first step, step one, the kayak characterization utilizes 36 indices. So about three to four indices for each of the 10 elements. And what we can do is that for farms or for aggregations of farms, we can represent those on a spider diagram. We, we create averages and standard deviations, et cetera, on that. Here's an example. The red is a farm in Cuba that's conventional farms. You can see it scores well in responsible governments, but lower in other aspects like diversity and resilience and recycling. The blue is a farm in transition to agroecology. Or sorry, that's green, the second one. And then blue is a diversified agroecological farm. So this is a chance to actually represent the sus sustainability of farms. The great thing about tape is that it actually includes several indices to measure pollinators and their habitats. So we're trying to create linkages between sustainable farms and by, by definition, aggregated to sustainable food systems or sustainable groupings of farms to pollination. And so in step one, we, we don't have a specific index just for pollinators, but we do include an index on efficiency that's on the management of pests and diseases. So you can see a farm scoring a zero uses chemical pesticides and drugs regularly, and they don't use other management. So this is again, step one. All the way up to a score of four for this index is that no chemical pesticides and drugs are used. Pests and diseases are managed through a variety of biological substances and prevention measures. So getting into IPM. So there is that aspect of step one. Step two includes quantifiable pollinators data, which is exciting. Um, and it also includes quantifiable pesticide usage. So in step two, we have 10 core criteria and one of our criteria um, is looking at pesticides and included in pesticides, we have, um, we have beekeeping. So we have an index on natural vegetation, trees and pollinators. And, and there you can see that for beekeeping, you assign a score to that farm. We also assign a, a score based on the productive area covered by natural or diverse vegetation. And then we also can assign a score on the presence of pollinators and beneficial animals. So we do this in step two, we're actually quantifying the performance of that farm for these particular indices. We also do this with pesticides. So we are actually quantifying the amount and types of pesticides that different farms are using. And we're also quantifying mitigation strategies, we're quantifying the use of integrated pest management strategies, etc. The exciting thing is that when we aggregate these, we start to see some trends. Here's the, the linkage between um, sustainable agriculture and pesticides through data. So in Mozambique, we sampled 539 
farms. And here is a relationship between our kayaks. So these are this is the the step one score from zero to hundred based on quintiles. And what you can see is that for um, beekeeping with bees and beekeeping, what we see is that bees and beekeeping increases in Mozambique with increasing kayak. So the more agroecological the farm is, the more likely bees are going to be raised and are widespread on those farms. Here's another example from Mozambique. This is pollinator presence. And um, what we see is that, again, these are the quintiles of Kayat on the left. And what we see is that pollinator presence increases with the increasing agroecological score of those farms. Um, we, it's hard to form causality because again, pollinators need sustainable ag and sustainable ag needs pollinators. So that's, that's hard, but we do see clear tendencies with this. In Lesotho, um, here is an example of the relationship between the pesticide index. So we take those scores and we actually create an index on the pesticide. And the pesticide index, one is a lot of use of pesticides, hazardous pesticides use, no or low other, no or low integrated pest management. Five is good. So that's important to know. One is a poor score, five is a, a higher score. What we see here is that bees and beekeeping increases with better pesticide management. Again, is it the chicken or the egg? This just shows the, the relationship and the tendency, but it's a very strong tendency. As your pesticide use decreases, and as you use other integrated pest management, um, you're more likely to see bees being raised or widespread on those farms. Here's an example from Lesotho. Um, here is our pesticide quintile again on the left, and this is for pollinator presence. And what we find is that bees and pollinator presence increases with better pesticide management. So another exciting trend there. In Uganda, what we see here is um, the abundance. So as pesticide management becomes better, as you get a better score in pesticide management, um, you see that the abundance and the incidence of pollinators tends to increase. Um, but when you look at the same farms, looking at the total of the kayak, step one, what we find is that explains much better um, the abundance of pollinators than on this last slide. So there is, there is a tendency here, but it's much better explained by the, over, the overarching agroecological score of that farm. Um, so that's exciting. What we're seeing is through this data, we're starting to see signals that as farms and as households, and then when you aggregate them, so as territories become better, be as they transition to agroecology, as they transition to more sustainable practices, what we see, we're starting to see trends that pollinators and beekeeping are benefiting from that. Um, I am almost out of time. I want to just share a couple of tools for pollinator protection and, and promotion that you can use, or I'd be remiss. Um, we have assessed and we've created tools for assessing pollinators. And so on our website, fao.org backslash pollination uh, and, and the various UN languages, we have protocols to detect and, mon and monitor pollinator communities. We've created a handbook for participatory socioeconomic evaluation. We have rapid assessment of pollinator status. We have guidelines for the economic valuation of pollinator services at the national scale. We even have Excel sheets that you can use for some of these calculations. So that's on our FAO pollination page. We have about 25 different resources, all free to download and use. We also have, um, we also share often on our Global Action on Pollination website. So we update new publications, news and event on there. We, we advertise for World Bee Day. We have a stock taking that we've done of regional, national, and local pollinator plans and initiatives. Um, we have a pollination database that needs to be updated. So if you know anyone that wants to um, donate money to update that database, we would be thrilled for that. We also encourage you, NAPSI, and all your um, affiliates and those of you joining here, if you have 
If you have upcoming events or resources that you would like to share, please let us know and we'd be happy to share those on our website. We also have the Agroecology Knowledge Hub and Pollinator Agenda is mainstreamed in FAO's work on agroecology and ecosystem services, as well as our broader work on sustainable agriculture. Um, and we're happy to also share events and resources related to, to agroecology here. Um, we also do work in pesticide management in FAO. We have an international code of conduct on pesticides management, as well as a pesticide registration toolkit. So uh, that's helpful if you're working at all in pesticide management, especially at the policy level. And we have other practical tools. We have the Younger Challenge Badge just came out on World V-Day. So this is the Youth and United Nations Global Alliance. It's great. It was um, the, it's useful for scouts, for school groups, et cetera. So check that out. Younger has a whole range of, of challenge badge challenge badges that you can use. Uh, Tika, if you're working at all in the developing world, our Tika website has a lot of very practical um, guides on beekeeping and pollination and best practices. So with that, I want to thank you very much and um, look forward to your questions. Hello, hello there, good morning. Uh, my name is Valerie Segrist and I am a member of the Muckleshoot tribe and um, which is located just south of Seattle, Washington in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, uh, right at the base of Mount Rainier in between the Green and White Rivers. And um, my background is in nutrition and uh, herbal medicine. I've taught uh, community-led classes and informal um, health curriculum classes for over a decade. Uh, my passion is in the like getting people outside and uh, in their environment and creating new memories and new opportunities to learn. That is what I live for. And, um, and so today I'm here to talk to you all about indigenous land practices and how uh, those practices can improve our food systems and also, of course, pollinator health. I am not a, uh, an expert on, you know, butterflies and bees and bats, like many of you probably are, um, but I do, I am fascinated by all species that show up to ecosystems to help, up, to help uphold the health and integrity of the land. And so um, I hope to really convey that in a very short period of time. And I wanted to start by saying, you know, the shorelines of the Pacific Ocean and the Salish Sea, where I'm from, um, rise up to these snow-capped peaks of the Cascades and the Olympic Mountains. And the land and the waters of the Pacific Northwest Coast are just teeming with native foods. I mean, you go outside and you're tripping over food here if <laughs> you know what you're looking for. Um, and we don't, you know, consider our foods to be resources or commodities. They are our greatest teachers and our relatives, and they're waiting for us right outside the door. The land supports a great diversity of ecosystems here, from lowland prairies and mountainous meadows to freshwater uh, wetlands and saltwater estuaries, and these ancient dense, beautiful, gorgeous, ancient forests, uh, food forests, really. And so much of the abundance of food and diversity of landscapes is directly linked to active cultivation by native people. And that is a common misunderstanding. In fact, when uh, Captain Vancouver sailed into the Puget Sound in the uh, the late 1700s, he wrote in his journal that he had never seen land so untouched by man before. And what he didn't understand is that he was looking at very well-maintained uh, food production systems that is something nowadays we would just call agriculture. But because we have this paradigm that has rippled through time of what farming and growing food looks like, 
um, that has unfortunately impeded people's idea of management of natural resources for food production. And that's just a common narrative. Maybe many of you here don't share that. I totally understand. But the common narrative in even the environmental movement is that every time man steps into nature, we wreck everything around us. And that's just not true. That's not the way our ancestors uh, helped actually maintain and create abundance on the lands of the Pacific Northwest. And so because of that, I wanted to spend some time today really talking about cultural ecosystems. And this is kind of like a new buzzword. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's just gaining more attention um, every year in this work. And cultural ecosystems are these physical manifestations of landscapes of processes and relationships that include and require human involvement with them if they are to continue to exist. And there are several examples of that I'm going to go through, but um, just for like quickly, when we talk about Native people harvesting, you get this image of someone sort of fumbling and, uh, you know, stumbling through the forest lands to forage and pick whatever they find uh, on the ocean or on the forest floor. But really the way in which we're taught to harvest, the ethical harvest, uh, promotes so many different methods of cultivation and tending to the land. The selective harvesting, for example, replanting, digging and tilling the soil, weeding, coppicing, pruning, burning the landscape, uh, sowing seeds, of course, and transplanting. Those are all um, methods of cultivation. And those are all uh, integral practices to Coast Salish harvesting efforts. Um, we've also, you know, are, are, have developed these social institutions that ensure certain groups of people and particular families uh, take responsibility for caring for particular places on the landscape. And I love this as a, as a um, reminder, this is the Swinomish tribal seasonal round. And uh, my, I have many relatives from Swinomish and uh, it's just sort of, it's organized by a lunar calendar, which is something that uh, for thousands of years, indigenous communities all over the globe uh, organized their lives around these lunar calendars that were often named after agricultural production of the season or the time. In fact, there are like, there's um, archaeological evidence of, of this dating back 12,000 years or yeah, 12,000 years in Scotland. Uh, so all over the planet, people organize their lives around lunar calendars for the purposes of farming and growing food and organizing our lives around when the best time of harvest and production was. And it was only until like the 1600s when we started shifting our attention away from lunar uh, organization to uh, solar. And that's now the Gregorian calendar that we organize our lives around. It wasn't even until the early 1900s till countries like China and Russia got on board with that. For, uh, for several thousands of years since time immemorial, we have uh, looked at a lunar calendar, a seasonal calendar, and that has informed and shaped how we move along the land and how we interact with that land. Um, I want to talk about Camas Prairies because this is an ex uh, extreme example of a cultural ecosystem. Camas Prairies exist from Canada into Northern California. They were brought here via glacier uh, during the, the Great Glacial Retreat um, about 10 to 12,000 years ago. If you were standing in the city of Seattle, in fact, I think I have a really cool image here. Um, oh no, I can't see the... Okay, I'll get to it. If you're standing in the city of Seattle, you would um, you would be about a mile and a half underneath a glacier during this time. And when that glacier retreated, it tilled up the soil and brought with it all these camas bulbs and camas prairies. So you have this really rich glacial till that uh, exists from Canada into Northern California. You could walk through them. Nowadays, we call it like the I-5 corridor. Uh, without human intervention, without burning, harvesting, uh, maintaining, organizing our life around when this, uh, this flower was in bloom and therefore the root was ready to be, the bulb was ready to be harvested, 
we would have had Camas Puri swallowed up by lowland secession forests thousands of years ago. So without the intervention uh, of, of Coast Salish ancestors harvesting these uh, Camas Prairies and maintaining them, they would have been non-existent thousands of years ago. This is important because uh, you know nowadays fewer than 3% of our traditional prairie lands are still intact. And the pollinators, I think about the pollinators that you know, we're so, have so much abundance to live within um, and how urban sprawl and uh, just colonization of this land has impeded their ability to maintain a way of life. Um, these are just some pictures of, you know, ways in which Camas prairies have been maintained um, through that thick ice coverage which is this, I don't know if you can see my pointer. I'm so annoyed it's not showing up, but this is the thick ice coverage. There was a space needle right here that you're not seeing. Um, and the fire, the land being burned. So historically for a few weeks out of the year, Coast Salish ancestors, and I mean, we still to this very day do this. Um, they'll go camp on the on the Camas Prairie lands and start harvesting from the outside in. And when they get to the center, there's this big earthen oven that's dug out and people would all combine their harvest into this oven and roast those bulbs in the earth for two days. And that, that 48 hour period would create um, a slow and low roasting situation on the bulbs and the inulin would become available. This really special bio a phytochemical that actually helps our body balance glucose and feeds our payers patches, which are like the doorways to our immune systems in our body. So this is really an important, very, um, you know, somebody told me once, I think it was one of the organizers actually from this conference that like the, the foods that were, that are so rich in nutrition are the ones that are pot that rely on pollinators. And I time and time again, am, am seeing this in our cultural ecosystems teachings. Um, these, these prairies are that burning element too. Um, some people have in their mind, this like image Smokey the bear does a really good job of teaching us this, right? Like scorched earth, totally wrecking everything around us. But people who burned prairies had, that was their job. They held knowledge, which was their wealth around how to burn at a certain level on a good day when there was enough fog and moisture in the air to make sure it didn't burn at a really high rate. And that would also preserve habitat for pollinators so that it wasn't this scorched earth situation where they had no um, nothing to live or survive or thrive on or that they themselves would get burned up in the process. So the this was like a, a highly knowledgeable person who knew the technique and the technology behind uh, burning lands in an effective way that also maintained the health and livelihood of all things. And of course, camas prairies are not just camas. They've got tons of other different types of plants that pollinators rely on to exist, like chocolate lily, one of my favorites, fritillaria or rice root, where, you know, you actually have to harvest it to reseed it. <laughs> it's really important. And balsam root, which is also really an important food for um, maintaining blood sugar in the body. And I think about the Puget Blues that are out there in those prairies and the um, all the beautiful pollinators that uh, rely on these uh, systems to exist. There's also the mountain huckleberry meadows, another example of how people maintained um, berry production fields for thousands of years. In fact, there's archeological evidence in some of my traditional territory that dates back 4,500 years, which is like wild to think about because woolly mammoths were walking around up in the mountains then. And, uh, and Rome hadn't even been thought of, you know, it's just like these ancient, older than Colosseum type uh, knowledge systems that are living out there on the land for us to remember, to help us remember how long we've been maintaining and taking care of the abundance that we witness in the, in the Northwest region every single day and what's left of it, you know, that that was on the backs of our ancestors and that they did a really good job getting to know how to live on the land in a way that promoted abundance for everybody. Um, 
This is a picture of Lena Waters Pinkham drying mountain huckleberries. And I just love the technology here, that smoldering log, that smoke drying huckleberries. I've never had these in my life, but it is a life goal of mine uh, to, to eat a, a smoke dried huckleberry and learn how to do it in fact. Um, but harvesting mountain huckleberries actually helps create abundance. Um, the more berries you pick, the more they grow. And uh, that's also true for burning the prairies. And I um, did a little deep dive on pollinators of huckleberries, which is pretty um, like uh, a lot of information out there is, is uh, hard to access around this, but I was really excited about honeybees being um, one of the fun pollinators of, of huckleberries and how uh, we, we really need them to help produce that berry. That berry is incredibly high in vitamin C and antioxidants, and it's one of the only fruits on the planet that does not raise your blood sugar. In fact, it balances blood sugar and it repairs broken capillaries in the body. And it's one of the biggest medicines we have in our creation story around huckleberry. It comes down to the teaching that huckleberry is the blood of the earth and it's a powerful medicine that's here for us, but we also have to take care of it as well. Um, I, I can't uh, not mention Billy Frank Jr. who um, made a really good point to talk about food forests and how um, <laughs> Beacon Hill had started this food forest uh, a, a community in Seattle that um, they kept declaring as the first of the food forest in Seattle. And he thought the same thing I did. Um, there was actually a food forest here pre-contact and it still is. Uh, there actually are several versions of it. When we look at the forest floor the, the, or even just these dense forests that, are, that surround us, they're full of food. Um, not just like deer and elk, but uh, lots of good plant life that is edible and medicinal as well. And so I think about uh, things that are all needing pollinators as well. Um, I'm not sure about nettles. I don't really think they need a pollinator. They're pretty prolific. They're dynamic accumulators that pull uh, things out of soil that we absolutely need, like magnesium and calcium and iron, things that build our blood, manufacture our blood in our body, and then help us um, to uh, detoxify out of our kidneys and liver. So build up our stamina and help us let go of what no, no longer serves us. But we also have beaked hazelnuts, which uh, have a 10,000 year old archaeological tradition here that um, archaeologists can date back to and salal berry, which many people think are is a poisonous food, but it's not. Um, or they think it's just for rose flower arrangements or floral arrangements. And it makes a great floral arrangement. But it's also um, a pretty big medicine. It's a flame retardant, which helps to keep um, fires from burning um, at a low level. And, um, and when I think about the forest floor, I also think about salmonberry and they're, uh, they're so prolific around here and the teaching of salmonberry. I've got, um, I've also got images of cattail in here because it's another really useful riparian wetland zone. That's another um, food ecosystem to consider, but um, salmonberry is, this really beautiful uh, bush that comes out in the springtime. And it's one of the first greens that comes out in the early spring. The, um, the teaching around it is always to me just distills down to the interconnectedness. And it may be like one of the least, uh, what do I wanna say, popular or well-known berries around. Um, but, and people really wonder about it, but it's not like a huckleberry or a salal berry or a thimble berry. It's just salmon berry. <laughs> and uh, that just salmon berry has a lot to teach us though. There are five different uh, colors of salmon berry that range from like a golden raspberry looking to a ruby red magenta. And those different, each different color of berry represents 
the five different nations of salmon people um, that you know arrive here and return to their ancestral rivers every single year. And the um, there's also some really cool connections where the root word uh, in our language and some of our dialects for salmon berry is also shared with the root word for butterfly, which is a pollinator called yo-yo butch. And, uh, and that it has this beautiful pink magenta flower that comes out. And in order for that flower to bloom, this bird has to sing its song, the Swainson's thrush. So when the Swainson's thrush sings its song, the berry or the blossom opens and that opening of that blossom is an indicator of how well the salmon run will be that year. And also around that time, this black and white butterfly shows up and uh, we have oral tradition that, that teaches us that when the black and white butterfly shows up, it's also time to start preparing for our first salmon ceremony because the salmon are going to return and we want to harvest that first salmon and have it make a big deal about it and celebrate it and then um, eat that salmon and we then we put the bones back in the water because the teaching is that that salmon spirit will go back to its people and share with it with its uh, community how well it was treated and how honored it was and that that is that's the ultimate um, that's the ultimate message that we want to give to our our food um, which are our, our teachers and our relatives like I, I said in the beginning and look at this gorgeous picture. This is done by Sandy Hill, who I found it on Flickr and I wanna like cite her correctly because there was no like way to purchase it, but I just had to put it in here because I couldn't stop looking at it. Hummingbirds also pollinate salmonberry. Um, and I just love how they share that beautiful magenta color. So just to wrap it up, Ecosystems are communities of living organisms that interact with their physical environments and one another. So humans to butterflies, to hummingbirds, to bats, to bees, to berries, we are all connected. And that we all have a part and a role that we play in producing the abundance of life. And I think we make that decision every single day of our life. Cultural ecosystems are diverse landscapes that depend on humans for their continued existence, that we do play an important role and we should take that role seriously. If we continue to think of ourselves as disposable to this world, um, that you know, plants and, and animals will be just fine without us, that's okay, but we can also live here and still um, manage and walk kindly and thoughtfully and, and have good ethics when we're out on the land and interacting with every precious creature out there. Indigenous people have stewarded cultural ecosystems in the Northwest coast for thousands of years. If you ask any muckleshoot person, we'll tell you since time began. Humans are ecosystem engineers and we have created a diversity of cultural ecosystems all over the world. This is not just specific to the Northwest, it's just my knowledge and wheelhouse, but this happens globally. From every, every single one of us has a traditional background with, of knowledge, of ecological knowledge, and we should all be proud and we should all be searching for that and bringing it out to the surface again, because it has a lot to teach us and it's going to inform and shape the success or failure of our future food systems and how we feed people really well. We can have a positive impact on the landscapes around us. We totally can, it's our decision. And our human health is related to the health of the land and all pollinators that are on the land as well. A pleasure to join you today, albeit remotely. My name is Nicole Hoffman, Director of World Central Kitchen's Food Producer Network, which partners with and supports farmers, fishers, and small food-related businesses and organizations that produce or distribute food at a local level by providing funding, training, and networking opportunities. Today, I will be presenting about how World Central Kitchen is creating resilient food systems by supporting food-producing communities and the pollinators that in turn support our food producers. Before diving in, I'd like to show you the context in which World Central Kitchen operates. We show up, boots on the ground, and we start feeding people. And in the process, the plan shows up. People don't want a solution one week from now, one month from now. The solution has to be now. 
you began taking care of people, the reconstruction began much earlier. Here we are with more than 40 small farmers that we are giving grants. One day they will have a very big percentage of the foods they consume produced right here in the island. Food relief cannot be about check. A plate of food for us is a way to have a contract with the communities. We come and we tell them, here we are and we'll come back tomorrow and the day after until you are okay. Whatever there is a fight so hungry people may eat, we will be there. World Central Kitchen uses the power of food to nourish communities and strengthen economy in times of crisis and beyond. We believe in the power of food to be a positive force for people and communities around the world. Guided by this belief, we have transformed the field of disaster response to help devastated communities recover and establish resilient food systems. Our work can be divided into two broad categories, relief and resilience. When disaster strikes, World Central Kitchen's chef relief team mobilizes to the front lines with the urgency of now to start cooking and providing meals to people in need. We know that good food provides not only nourishment, but also comfort and hope, especially in times of crisis. We have served more than 50 million meals to people impacted by natural disasters and other crises around the world. After World Central Kitchen has led a food relief activation and the emergency has subsided, we have the capacity to make long-term commitments of support in places where we feel we can successfully address chronic food system challenges with our unique blend of talents and resources. We think about the aftermath of disaster in three phases. Immediate relief, when we are serving meals to communities impacted by a crisis, recovery, which is a medium-term response that focuses on getting a food system up and running and helping farmers to get back to work and making sure that markets are functioning again. And last but not least, resilience, which advances human and environmental health, offers access to professional culinary training, creates jobs, and improves food security for the people we serve. Our resilience programs offer a range of areas, including clean cooking, food safety and sanitation, culinary education, and building resilient food systems. This drive to foster resilient food systems led to the creation of the Food Producer Network, or FPN for short, which establishes long-term sustainable support for farmers, fishers, and other food producers in order to build back a stronger food system. The Food Producer Network was established in Puerto Rico in 2018 in response to the devastating hurricane season the year prior. Since then, 3.7 million in grants have been dispersed to over 200 food producers affected by natural disasters in the Caribbean and Central America. In 2020, to support food security throughout the region, the program's geographical coverage expanded to include the United States Virgin Islands, the Bahamas, and Guatemala. The Food Producer Network advances sustainable agricultural practices that not only improve the capacity to grow and distribute food, but also those practices that are needed to ensure healthy environments for pollinators for generations to come. We and our grantees understand that without pollinators, there is no food. We know that there is a direct relationship between the number of bee colonies and the amount of food that can be produced. In recognition of this, of the $3.7 million we have invested in food-related businesses, over 300,000 have been directly invested in beekeeping and pollinator-related projects. Hi, this is Nicole from World Central Kitchen, checking in from Moca, Puerto Rico. Today, we're visiting Apiario Puente Real, where Daniel Perez is putting his over 35 years of beekeeping experience to use, producing honey, pollen, queen bees, and other hive products. Daniel is one of the latest Food Producer Network grantees in Puerto Rico, and he'll be using his World Central Kitchen grant to purchase a 40-foot container and over 100 hive boxes. Together, this will help him increase his resilience against future natural disasters by providing a safe storage space, increase his honey production with more available hives. Um, Daniel is a huge 
proponent of apiculture, not only here in Puerto Rico, but in the international stage with his YouTube channel, where he teaches people of all ages and students all across the world about beekeeping, which is so important to us because as Daniel always says, Sin abejas, no hay agricultura. without beekeeping, there is no agriculture. As I mentioned earlier, the Food Producer Network has its origins in Puerto Rico as the island reeled from the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. That crisis clearly put into perspective the effects that climate change and more frequent natural disasters can play on pollinator populations. Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico's native bee population, wiping out nearly 80% of local hives. Not only this, the hurricane also leveled the island's lush vegetation, putting pollinator populations at even greater risk. However, what we are also able to observe is the resilience of bee populations, which quickly adapted and began to thrive from ground level plants like chamomile and other herbs. We have witnessed the impacts of natural disasters across the region. In Guatemala, FPN is active in parts of the country most affected by the Fuego volcano eruption of 2018. We took the Food Producer Network to the Bahamas as part of our response to Hurricane Dorian. We learned the cyclical impact of climate change on the pollinator ecosystems and saw a real opportunity to help food producers develop and implement practices that minimize risk to them and the pollinators they rely on. This is happening on many fronts. We are investing in infrastructure improvements that can make food producers and their products more capable of withstanding natural disasters. We are investing in projects that advance sustainable agroecological farming practices that can range from a focus on propagating native plants to minimizing the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides or replacing these with pollinator friendly agrochemicals. We are teaching local farmers about the best practices to attract and protect pollinator populations on their farm, which in turn will help them increase their food production. We are connecting food producers throughout the region with pollinator experts so that they can fully grasp the relevance of healthy pollinator populations to their business. An issue some food producers in the Caribbean and Central America encounter is that the apiculture literature does not focus on the climatic characteristics and vulnerabilities of their region. For example, food producer network members operate their food businesses in areas that are prone to hurricanes, volcanic activity, and earthquakes. And in several Caribbean islands, European bees have mixed with Africanized bees to produce new colonies of resilient, productive, yet gentle bees that have proven resistant to the colony collapse seen in much of North America. This highlights the need to foster ongoing discussions and capacity building exercises that connect food producers from these regions so that they can share best practices that apply directly to their needs. To address this issue, the Food Producer Network offers capacity building opportunities on a weekly basis in both English and Spanish. Our webinars focus on business skills, technical training, and resilience. These opportunities are free and open to the public, including any business, organization, or individual seeking to improve their food production, distribution, and sales. The Food Producer Network also provides a platform for grantees to engage in networking opportunities, allowing for further in-depth exchange and ideas and knowledge that are, that are helping improve agricultural practices. We recognize the importance of deepening the knowledge in this field amongst the farmers in our network of grantees. Because of this, and in partnership with the Cornell Douglas Foundation, in August of 2020, we launched the Beekeeping for Farmers program in Puerto Rico which provided the knowledge and tools needed to teach beekeeping to 20 farmers from all over the island. The program's curriculum was developed alongside Rafael Sola from Salvemos las Abejas, a local beekeeper and FPN grantee in Puerto Rico. In addition to being a beekeeper, Mr. Sola is an attorney and a co-creator of Law 156, known as Puerto Rico's Pollinator and Protection and Preservation Law which established the protection and conservation of pollinators as public policy to create an environment conducive to the population development of pollinators with new agricultural rules that promote the integration of pollinators in the cultivation process and that protect them from the use of harmful pesticides. Together, we developed a theory, series of theoretical and practical classes that covered basic facts about bees, rescuing wild or abandoned hives, queen bee production, and the commercialization of hive products. 
With this program, World Central Kitchen was able to support a comeback of the local apicultural sector by supporting the installation of new beehives that host 1 million bees that now offer pollination services to the island crop. This program also created the opportunity for the participant farmers to increase their income through the sale of derivative products such as honey and beeswax products. Altogether, this program strengthened not only the skills of members of our immediate FPN networking, but is having a real and immediate impact on the Puerto Rican beekeeping sector and will certainly continue to do so in the future. Participants have provided universally and overwhelmingly positive feedback about the program. During recent visits as one of the year follow-up efforts, 60% of participants reported an increase in their food production. As another example, to mark World Bee Day this year, we held an interview with a beekeeper, a series which included capacity building webinars led by beekeepers from our network of grantees. The two beekeepers who led these interactive discussions were Luckner Timothy from Grand Bahama and Rafael Sola, lead instructor of our Beekeeping for Farmers program. Over the course of each two hour webinar, they answered a myriad of questions, <coughs> excuse me, from farmers and beekeepers from across the Caribbean and Central America regarding best practices to ensure a healthy relationship between food production and pollinator populations. He gave simple and easily replicable tips on how to attract pollinators, how to feed them after a hurricane and how to rescue wild hives. Here, Mr. Timothy describes his journey as he came to recognize the values bees have to the well-being of his business and ultimately his community as a whole. Uh, as a farmer, I almost feel the shame to say that I didn't know how important bees were to, to, to the environment. <laughs> and the more I get into it, and especially I remember seeing a video once that they were like separating um, the, the amount of food that's produced with bees from the food that were produced without bees. And when I looked at what was on the table, I was like, that's, that's absolutely nothing. Like, we really don't appreciate all the value of it. We've had people that just killing bees for a long time. And we don't read, and no one's teaching us the value of bees. So that's why one of the things that I'm pushing is getting into bees, getting more experience, knowing how to be keep, because I would love to go into the schools and start to teach kids how important these bees are so they can take it back home to their parents and start to build a relationship so we can understand how important these are. Without bees, oh God, it's bad. It, it's really, really bad. One thing is clear. People in this field, as shown by the beekeepers in our network of grantees, are passionate about sharing their knowledge and patient enough to sit and chat with anyone, regardless of age or level of expertise, about what changes can be made to promote pollinator health. At the same time, food producers are eager to learn practices that will improve their businesses and make them more resilient to future disasters, whether natural or man-made. During the webinar, Mr. Sola led, he emphatically told participants that small-scale farmers offer hope to bees around the world. Through Food Producer Network grants, we not only provide direct financial support to advance agricultural practices that benefit pollinators, we also provide a platform for experts to advocate and promote those practices to a receptive audience willing to implement the changes needed to advance healthy agricultural practices. Our efforts to instill the relevance of healthy pollinator populations, both within the food producer network and across the food producing communities of Central America and the Caribbean are ongoing. To that end, on November 9th, we will be convening our grantees for an apicultural roundtable discussion. At the core of all of these efforts is the understanding that supporting pollinators has a direct positive impact on strengthening food security and that healthy agricultural practices create a better environment for pollinators. Thank you so much for your time. The next round of Food Producer Network grant applications will open in Puerto Rico in November. Applications for Guatemala, the Bahamas, and the U.S. Virgin Islands will open once again in 2022. Please feel free to refer projects in those regions that you believe will advance resilience and food security and would benefit from a grant from us. I look forward to our exchange during the interactive session. Thank you. everybody, uh, and thanks for including us in the annual NAPSI meeting. Uh, thanks to the Pollinator Partnership for making this happen and inviting us to speak. 
Um, Eric and I are going to talk about rewarding farmers for the collective benefits of installing pollinator habitat. Those are the benefits that accrue not to the farmer themselves, but to their neighbors uh, and the neighbors of the neighbors. I'm Taylor Ricketts from the Gund Institute for Environment at the University of Vermont. And I'm Eric Lonsdorf at the Institute on the Environment based at the University of Minnesota. And we've been working together on these issues for 15 years or so, and we're excited to tell you about them. So a bit of uh, context nationally. Um, this is a map of the national status of wild bee abundance led by Institute Co five or so years ago, just showing where the status of abundance and populations of bees are likely to be high, uh, where they're likely to, to be at full strength. Uh, those are places in blue versus low uh, in yellow. Essentially, we found that in about a quarter of the US's land surface, bee populations had declined over the previous five years to this study. And you can just see the imprint in yellow here of intensified agriculture. That's where we are predicting low bee abundance. This matters because a lot of crops, of course, need pollination to set full fruits and produce full strength. So this is a map of that map I just showed you crossed with a map of where pollinator dependent crops are. And the thing to zero in on are the hot pink counties outlined in red or yellow. This is where supply is low, but demand is high. This is where we'd expect a mismatch or a problem with insufficient pollination. So the reason counties are on this map differ in terms of the crops that demand pollinators, but they all share in common this status where um, we're predicting that pollinator abundance is insufficient or most likely to be insufficient to meet that demand. So this is really a map of where to worry about crop pollination services. And it just gives a context about where we should be working on restoring pollinator habitat. What we wanna zoom in now though is the economics of that restoration of pollinator habitat. This can be alongside fields like on the right next to blueberries or even under solar panels near agricultural landscapes. This is a really common intervention to try to restore the populations of these pollinators we need so much in our agricultural landscapes. But there's a, still a question that's really not all that resolved and that is when is restoration worth it? When does taking some crop out of production or using some uh, farm edge land for pollinator habitat, when do the benefits of that actually outweigh the costs of having done that, the installation costs and the maintenance costs and the opportunity costs of not growing something else there. That's something that's not all that well understood. And there's one more important wrinkle, which is these benefits and costs can accrue to the farmer themselves. So their benefits captured on their own land minus the cost it took them to install this pollinator refuge. But then there's the public net benefits because bees of course fly around they leave the property and they're gonna benefit neighbors as well. Those neighbors will have increased yields and they won't bear any of those costs. They're essentially free riders because the farmer pays all those costs. So this is a really common economic problem, um, common resource problem. And it's tricky to know what the appropriate policy is when somebody's actions benefit not only them, but their neighbors. And that's what we wanna explore here. So to do that, we're using a model that we've developed over a dozen years or so um, to predict the crop pollination impacts of a change in a landscape. And we're not gonna go into this model in anything other than a kind of cartoon way, but here's generally how it works. We have data on the nesting habitats and flower resources for all these different parts of the landscape. And from those, we estimate how abundant bees are in hedgerows or patches or scrub or whatever. And we allow those bees to fly around the landscape and they fly in part onto this yellow farm here. And those are visitation rates that we can estimate on that yellow farm and on every other farm in this landscape. And then we have functions that turn visitation rates into yields of the crop on that farm. And we've done this in a lot of places all over the world. The wrinkle we wanna add here is, now we're gonna add a hedgerow, this blue thing in a hedgerow. It's got its own abundance, that's what that A is. It costs something, that's what that C is, and it cost it to the private landowner, the person who owns the yellow farm, which is why that Y has a P next to it too. But crucially, those pollinators also visit the neighbor's land and increase yields externally to that farmer. That's why that's a Y 
sub E in the bottom left there, right? So a, a hedgerow going in alongside someone's land is expected to increase yields on that person's land, but also on the neighbor's land. And that's the sort of private versus public benefits problem that is uh, a little less straightforward from a policy point of view. So that's the intuition of the problem and the model we're gonna to use to explore that problem and come to some, some conclusions. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Eric, who's gonna get specific about this case study in California. Take it away, Eric. Thank you, Taylor. A great place to apply this model, the conceptual model that he just laid out kind of more specifically was California. It's one of the largest production areas in the United States, specifically with specialty crops and many of those crops that depend highly on pollinators. Uh, the list here is all those commodities where California leads the nation and those in bold um, or where California is the sole producer. So for example, almonds, which are highly dependent on external pollinators uh, is one example. And you can see from the map on the left uh, that many of those, um, those crops, there's a large diversity of those crops too. And so there's a lot of heterogeneity that we wanna take into account when we apply this uh, approach. So we chose to apply the conceptual model specifically to a county in California where we've done a lot of our own work uh, in Yolo County. And this, this, in, this area has all the information we need to apply the, the model. It has ownership layers. These are parcel information. We know the landowners there. Uh, we have information on uh, the crops shown here, all those different colors of different crops. And we have information on pollinator habitat. The red here is high quality habitat for pollinators and high abundance and the dark blues are low. And we can put all that information together. You know, this is zooming in up on a specific area to start determining where it makes sense, uh, where it doesn't make sense to put in pollinator habitat from an economic perspective. And we do that by using uh, quantitative relationships that illustrate the kind of build the model. So if we know something about the landscape around this, this parcel. Uh, here it's relatively low quality in the model. We can translate the, the model score into abundance. This is from empirical studies. All those black dots are field sites that we've uh, parameterized the models. We can translate abundance into pollen grains, pollen grains into seeds per fruit. This is from watermelons. And those seeds in the fruit of the watermelon actually are predictive of the size. And so larger watermelons can have uh, can be sold for more value at this at the grocery store. And with that information, we can then simulate kind of in silica or in the computer, uh, what happens if we add a restoration? And we can see sort of what the, how that translates into landscape and then how that landscape improvement uh, leads ultimately into yield. And what we're really interested in is then using land, the um, ownership information to determine where it makes sense uh, privately, so that those the benefits outweigh the cost for the individual who owns the land and is paying for the cost of the restoration. Or if it doesn't, if by adding in the benefits that are flowing outside, would that outweigh the, the cost? Or does it not make sense at all? There isn't enough value uh, being added. Okay. And so here's the kind of results that we have. And first, I'll point out this panel on the left. First, kind of take a look at these dark black areas here. These are cases where it does make sense for the individual paying for the cost or it makes sense privately. So the benefits um, are outweighing those costs. The gray areas are places where the landowner themselves is not um, getting enough benefit, but if you include their neighbors, there are enough benefits economically to outweigh the cost of that uh, hedgerow. Um, and the red area is kind of all around uh, are places where those net benefits uh, doesn't make sense at all, even when you add up all the, the neighbors. Okay, and then the, the figure on the right just shows sort of what the value of those total benefits are on a per hectare basis. Okay, so up to $8,000 per hectare, thinking in acres, that's about $4,000. So that's a pretty high value crop in itself, thinking of like the bee habitat as a crop providing value. Okay, so what does that mean for policy? Um, well, those dark areas, again, are where the payment is not needed. It should just be information that could be provided to that individual, that landowner saying that those private net benefits are greater than zero, it just makes sense to you to put in hedgerows. The gray areas are where the landowner themselves needs some sort of, sort of payment. Okay, and so that best strategy is going to vary within the landscape and how we target our public funds should depend on the context. 
Okay, and we can use that information to kind of be more uh, thoughtful, intentional, and effective with our payments. And so, uh, what are some of the patterns that we found uh, in those in those different contexts? Well, we found that privately, where when it does make sense, these are areas where the landowner has a relatively large field. So when they add a, a restoration, we're imagining that most of those benefits of the added bees are being captured within their own lands, and that the crop that they own is highly dependent on pollinators and is very valuable. So almonds would be a good example of this, uh, where they're highly dependent. Uh, they're often found in large um, uh, landowner parcels. All right, and we can, and our summary is that that actually only paid off for about 10% of the landowners. And because we're partitioning out all the private and external benefits, we found that adding those situations where we're adding a hedgerow would add half a million dollars in private value, but their neighbors would get more than twice that. Okay, that's pretty remarkable. And usually we don't account for that uh, in our policies. Uh, we can contrast that to those places where it makes sense sort of publicly. So where the landowner themselves wouldn't wanna pay for it, but that if you add in their neighbors, it makes sense. That's the gray areas in the map. And we found there that this was almost half of the landowners, okay, in our in Yolo County, where the costs of enhancement were greater than those private, the private benefits. But again, adding those neighbors would would be helpful. Um, and those landowners would lose one million dollars themselves, but generate more than two and a half million dollars for their neighbors. So again, um, overall, this would it would make sense. And this is a case where um, that landowner would require some payments. All right, and there's plenty of money to go around if it's uh, what our analysis suggests. Okay, so in summary. Yeah, so I'll jump back in here to start these yeah, lessons. Um, so the, the most important thing that we wanna leave you with is that ecosystem services, pollination in this case, but other ones too, flow among landowners. What a landowner does on his or her land affects the flow of services to the neighbors as well. Um, in, in this case, we were surprised to find that the neighbors received most of the benefits of restored pollinator habitat. So a farmer restoring pollinator habitat on their land is actually spilling over benefits to neighbors that add up to more than the benefits they themselves receive, even though they bear all the costs. Only 10% of farmers had private incentives to restore habitats. That means they had the benefits they got in terms of increased yields from pollinators outweighed the costs they paid to put those hedgerows in or pollinator habitats of any kind in. Another entire half of farmers, almost 50% more additional farmers um, uh, would produce net public good if they restored habitat. That is a restoration of a given farmer. If you added up the benefits to them and to all their neighbors, it would outweigh their costs, but they pay the costs. So some sort of cooperation or payments needed for the, for the biggest group of farmers that we studied. So that's kind of the big take home policy wise is that if we're gonna incentivize uh, habitat restoration for pollinators to the degree that we need to, to the degree that makes sense economically, it's really gonna rely on cooperation and payments among farmers or from governments to farmers, uh, but that could be targeted to those that are exporting more benefits than the costs that they incur. Any other lessons, Eric, before we wrap up? Uh, I, yeah, I guess I would just add that um, some of the lessons that we've learned, we've the specific context was for wild bees, but this high placement of honeybees would also be uh, something interesting to think about too. Obviously those, those bees can fly far and wide. Um, they're known to fly you know, a kilometer or more. Um, and that mm -hmm. kind of a logical next step uh, for this kind of work is to start engaging uh, the growers and farmers themselves to see about their willingness to kind of enter into these kind of um, cooperative management uh, routines. It will take, I think, uh, coordination uh, and discussion between kind of the analysts like ourselves and then extension uh, and crop advisors and that sort of thing. So that's sort of, a, I think, a really interesting next step for this. It is an interesting next step. We have some funding from the Knobloch Foundation, which we want to acknowledge to pursue much of what Eric just said in a cotton system in Texas. Not only repeat this public-private analysis, but also work really closely with cotton farmers uh, with the information on where priorities might be um, to pilot some of these 
restorations and maybe even the payments that would fund them. So we'll wrap up just by saying thanks to these people who collaborated with us on this project and these groups of people who have collaborated with us on this project uh, and these groups of people who have supported our work over 10 or 15 years that have led to the models that supported this project. Thanks again for giving us time at the NAPSI uh, annual meeting and we're looking forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you.